Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Dragon Age Inquisition. In the last episode, we did a bunch of stuff. We touched the Iron Bowl and Black Wall. I'm gonna run away. I'm gonna run away. Anyway, this episode, as you can see in the title, is a Codex episode. Uh, number three to be exact. But technically it's number four because I read a lot of Codexes in episode two. So I put that in the Codex thing as well. <laughs> But this is episode 4 of the Codex. I'm just gonna make sure I can... I'm gonna send out some stuff really quick and just finish these. So I can just do stuff while I'm in the Codex. The Outer Shade Dracolus. The creature has been cornered and saddled. The nippings were severe, but it waits for the Inquisitor to claim it in the stables. Mind your fingers. <laughs> what? You didn't train it. Choose a successor that's available. Those are completed. Completed, 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 completed. Everything's completed! Alright, Ferelden. What do you have for me? Alright, Inquisitor, I have no idea what to say. Scholars have debated whether Tyrion's legendary axe was an axe that was crystal, an axe with magically reinforced crystalline head, perhaps even just a very polished axe, but apparently the word translated from the ancient language commonly taken to be an axe, in fact, merely means hafted weapon. It is possible that the translations of the saga have been edited to, to admit evidence that Tyrion Bright Axe may have been using what seems, from all appearances, to be a staff as would more commonly be used by a mage. <laughs> I apologize for my confusion in this matter. I will endeavor to be more diligent in my translations in the future. Yours, Sister Dorka Square. Tear to staff. Oh, Tirda was a mage. I'm going to have to read about her. Oh, secret and Justin. Interestingly, the ruins are of Alamai in origin, belonging to the tribes that inhabited Ferelden almost a thousand years ago. What is of greater interest, however, is that none of the ruins translate intelligibly, meaning it is all in code. According to the translators, a reference to the Guardian also indicates an island off the northern coast. Most curious, I will continue translation efforts and hope we can narrow down this further. Narrow this down further. Whatever. <laughs> all the way you can see is available. Celebrate the Dragon's Legs available. Who's gonna do that? Josephine's gonna do that. <laughs> Wait, Wayne Heron of Troublesome, but the Wade's Town is undeniable, so then whatever Dragon 2 is going to use our souls. Wait, what? What is right about the Dragon the Inquisitor killed? The note passed by Josephine. Tell me, you sent soldiers correctly, grisly remains. We have nobles clamoring to see the head up close. Should have anticipated this. Gawking is for peasants, but it becomes civilized when done with a glass of wine in one hand and a fan in the other. And another from Pharrell and signed. Heron. Oh my god, Heron and Pival. Heron and Pival is still out there. Heron and Wade, yeah. I associate Wade. There's no throughout Thetis for his... Why did I hell did I say Pival? Oh yeah, because I was thinking of someone entirely different. Heron and Wade, yeah. <laughs> my associate Wade is known throughout Thetis for his talent by capturing... At capturing the glory of, of the Draconic and the armor he makes. The scarcity of Dragon Scale means that Wade is all too rarely afforded the chance to work in his chosen medium. But here's a solution. Wade shares his expertise with the Inquisition in exchange for the Dragon materials collected so far. Hmm. Let us stop at the trophies you've collected and put out the word. Celebrating our Dragon Slayer, fascinating the nobles will do anything for invitation. Uh, I like the idea of Colin Dailing with this one. Because he knows what Wade and Heron are about, but they do know what they're doing. Did that, is not it? I guess we're gonna check this out. Oh, wait and see. The Alamari runes found in the mountain. Well, this is probably gonna be... Oh shit, I can do something fast. Alamari runes found in the mountain passages outside Haven and finally given more of their secrets, pointing to one of the larger islands off the northern coast of Pharrell. The island is quite large and covered in dense wilderness, so searching it will be an involved process. According to the runes, however, there should be some connection to the original. Disciples of Andrasity and the Guardian of the Sacred Ashes. Hmm. This requires stealth. A few skilled agents given enough time to quietly search the islands. Know of a few adventurers trustworthy enough to send to the islands. Let them search and report back to us. As eh. soon as we show interest in the area, others will follow. Nah, I don't even care if Leilion's gonna take the office, I just let's see what we have. Let him do it secretly. Quietly. Let stuff happen. I mean Josephine's the only one that can do stuff. Gather coins probably, which she's gonna end up having to do. Unless this is no she might be able to do this. Uh, oh yeah, she's doing this. Part of a Ben Hasrath report noting the current fight for succession and lies or leads. I have no idea. Which has been 
Without a direct ruler since Duke Ramash died early in the Orlesian Civil War, the duchy will go to one of three members of the dead Duke's family, all of whom have possible claims to the position due to the complex nature of the Orlesian politics. His cousin Carolina, already a duchess by marriage, his daughter Monet, or Monet, whose claim is muddied by her youthful naivety and the fact that her father pushed her into a life of service to the Chantry after his wife's death, likely to protect her from the dangers of the game, and his brother John Gaspard, an ambitious and cunning man who has been searching for power. Carolina is capable and not overly invested in overseeing Lyde's personally. Monette would be most easily manipulated, but less likely to be useful. John Gaspard would be difficult to manipulate and could present a threat if he succeeds his brother. Any of the three candidates can become a valuable ally to the Inquisition, but the other two must be removed from the play first. <laughs> destroy a marriage? Maybe I shouldn't let Josephine mess around. I can destroy Carolina's marriage with four words and the proper glove left on the proper table. Good God, woman. She can swork her magic. Bonnet would do better in the Chantry than in the game. I can see that she is encouraged to take vows. Don Gaspard is a chevalier and capable military leader. If we want him removed, I dare say we might recruit him for ourselves. Oh, I kind of want Colin to do that. Yeah, that's all Colin. I like that. Fine. Then... No, 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 no. Uh, Josephine's gonna grab some point. <laughs> there you go, girl. We've done this one before. It's like a reoccurring one. So there we go. Now I'm ready to read stuff. Thank you guys. See you later. Bye. Later. Have a good one. Enjoy yourself. Alright, where's my codex? Characters. Blackwall. Hmm. I do not have much on Warden Blackwall. We know he became Constable of the Grey in Valshavin after Warden Constable Fontaine assumed the position of Commander of the Grey from her predecessor. He also bears the silver at Wings of Valor, an honor bestowed upon Elysian Wardens for deeds of great bearing. Daring. <laughs> Same thing. The details of the act for which Blackwall earned the silver at Wings, however, are sketchy. Grey Wardens hide their secrets well. The medal was likely awarded for a campaign to secure the deep road entrances within Orlais. Shortly after the Fifth Blight, several warden Grey Wardens lost their lives on that camp. I don't know why I'm having such trouble reading. Perhaps more would be dead if not for Blackwall. According to my sources, Gordon Blackwall has been traveling alone for several years now. The last anyone saw him in the keep in Valshavin was 937 Dragon. He's been completely abandoned along with all other warden outposts. So I believe Blackwall is as curious about the disappearance as we are. Perhaps in time we will find answers. <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. Anyway, let's read about Angle. M. My dear friend. I completely understand the difficulty you face. To have such well-equipped bandits attack your family's caravan so regularly and with such exquisite knowledge of new shipping schedules is highly indeed unfortunate. Is indeed highly unfortunate. <laughs> there is, it's getting late. <laughs> there is no shame at all in finding your household guards wanting in such trying circumstances. Circumstances. Ah, oh, darn it. <laughs> to answer your question, when faced with my own troubles last year, I employed the Bulls Chargers. Their leader, the Iron Bull, is a canary, a great horned giant of a man. He looked like a savage, but combat. <laughs> he looked like a savage, but spoke like a gentleman. He seems unstoppable in combat, but is far more clever than a simple swordsman. His mercenaries were costly, but they were both strong enough to protect my family's caravans and clever enough to discover how the bandits came into such luck in their attacks upon my family. The bandits have been no trouble at all since then and a baron of our mutual acquaintance effusively assured me that he would be greatly surprised if they ever again caused us difficulty. If you wish to employ the Iron Bowl, I can provide you with his contact information, as well as a list of the liquors he enjoys most particularly. <laughs> will your husband also be present in these negotiations, or will you be making the acquaintance of the Iron Bowl in a more intimate setting? If so, we shall have to talk the next time our men go hunting. Yours in friendship be. Wow. Letter lifted from the hidden drawer in a nobleman's vanity and copied carefully before it being returned. Well. Okay. Sarah. Okay. Yeah, there's more stuff added. Severity of the attributed actions vary widely from petty to outright vicious, while 
Official reports label these actions unfair, acknowledge of many main victims and several are suspect characters. Sarah would call them something altogether untoward. Yes, Mom shits a lot of them. We did read that. There are tales of Red Jenny targeting criminal slavers and even assassins guilds, the benefit of having a local that they are invested in regional concerns, although the obvious this obviously varies, I can assume no proof. Oh. Okay, this is okay. Addendum. Yeah, yeah. Sarah's claim to have lived in Denver and cannot be verified, but seems likely the aliens there was never neither stable nor secure. Many residents of the city fled the region following the blight. Given her nature, Val Royale would have seemed ripe with targets. Enarm has more than a share of suspect nobility, but most were rallied against a common enemy thanks to the efforts of the hero of her own. <laughs> Why do I keep doing that? I keep using the wrong freaking scrolly button thing. <laughs> oh god. Go back, go back, go back. Okay, okay, okay. There we go. <laughs> Force two more like shits and double shits. Denim on Red Jenny. Caches in populated areas, it bewilders how such things go unnoticed, but perhaps that is the power of the practice servant. They are keenly aware of what escapes the preoccupied eye. Sarah, of course, can spy them instantly. She seems an extreme version of a very narrow definition of perceptive. I press for a schedule or even some hint of procedure, but she is content to rely on the unknown. It may seem exciting, but I should find it ever so frustrating if I were searching. It's just red, right? But she'd see it if it was on a hat out of season. Yeah. <laughs> Addendum on Sarah's fascination with dragon. I do not know what Sarah finds in dragons that enthralls her so, but it is clear from her excited admissions that battling them speaks to her in a way from which she is not prepared. <laughs> At least in my estimation. If you seek an admission, at best she will declare that, that was grand. Or similar. She's hardly introspective. Nevertheless, she has expressed an interest in any future hunt. Rude drawing of Sarah, tongue out standing atop a dragon, mimicking its horns with her fingers. Piss, can't draw saddles. <laughs> she wanted to <laughs> draw herself riding a dragon. Awesome. You could go like practice, like we have horses. So there's saddles out there. Which one's new? Alright, 12 and 13 are new, yeah? That's what it's like. Ooh, a prophet's laurel. Oh yeah, I got this. According to an Elysian folklore, Andrasse's followers and sympathizers tossed sprigs of the laurel in her path as she was led to her pyre. After she burned, her ashes blew across the leaves on the ground, bestowing upon them their famed purifying qualities. It is just a tale, of course. The laurel was recognized as a healing herb long before Andrasse's time. Ancient Deventer scrolls describe the use of the laurel in poultices, tinctures, and even incense. Though the legend might be a pure fabrication, the laurel will always be symbolic of Andraste's sacrifice. Its glossy dark leaves represent the Sword of Mercy, with the red berries, the drops of her blood upon it. Excerpt from the Botanical Compendium by Inez R. Valencia. Yeah. The same chick that writes about every plant ever. Rash vine! Be wary when harvesting rash vine because of the plant comes by its name honestly. Indeed, calling it its effect upon exposed skin or rash is an understatement. I've known apprentices who went without trading the red sores, assuming the irritating but harmless and eventually required them either magic healing or amputation. Oh, god damn. Once the poison gets into the blood, it causes a pimple calcification that turns the surface of the skin stone gray. That's only the first symptom. In addition, it's primarily found in the marshes and remote areas of deep vegetation, so there is often danger in finding rash vine patches, even aside from that and collecting it. Fortunately, or unfortunately, if one happens to be a witless apprentice, rash vine has a number of useful applications. Salves that harden the skin or otherwise provide protection, not to mention being one of the primary ingredients for Antiven fire. My advice? Use thick gloves and carry a sword. From Herbology and Thetis. Oh, it's a different person. Master Alien Grabire. <coughs> mm. Okay. Sorry about that, I had a little cough. Creatures. Who else? Oh, you bitches. Bogfisher. These guys suck. They were in a fallow mire and beat my ass. I accompanied Marquis de Archambault upon this expedition reluctantly. 
I'll do the Archambon. Insisted that an exploration to show me the truth and the beauty of the world might assuage the cons consternation with which I observed it. Come on, game. It's like really late. I'm running on like not that much sleep. And you're wanting me to read assuage and consternation? <laughs> what the hell? As we entered the caves, the cold and brackish water dripping incessantly, we came upon blah, blah. <laughs> We came upon a hulking beast whose great flapping paws slapped the stone. In countenance, it was broad, its flaps of hide hanging loose across its bristled back. The Archambon drove it away, laughing at its clumsiness, heedless of the delicate. Delicate fangs, what? <laughs> Protruding at unknowable angles from its dis. Tended maw. Who the hell wrote this? Shakespeare? He said the beast or bogfish, as the locals called it, was a flailing vestige in the land of men fit to be tamed or slain. That night, camp beside an underground lake, its rippling waves, a susurrus, susurrus, <laughs> susurrus of inhuman whispers, thank God, the sepulchral emptiness of the starless night. I know what that word means, I just had trouble saying it. Emptiness of the starless night was vast. Our own fire pitiful in its sullen rebellion against the unending dark. God damn it. Bogfish just slipped from the lake, its flapping paws, perfectly equipped to propel it through the water. Its spiny maw closed upon the Arshan bond. <laughs> then the Marquis was gone. That all around and you did it on purpose, dude. His frantic thrashing. <laughs> All we could see in the frenzy white water was the bogfish to pull them under. That night I knew this was not the land of men. The lightless torpid waters were not tamed. Men are but ants crawling witlessly across a lily pad in a pond. Most think the emerald land bound to their tiny will. Those few who peer over the edge and see the leviathan's pale bellied scales shimmering in the colors with no name swimming beneath them can only scurry away, trying in vain to articulate the vast and uncaring terror that awaits. What my eyes have seen and my limited mind may never comprehend, but I shall never draw near dark water again. The bog fisher has taught me well, yet they suck but From an Anatomy of Various Terrible Beasts by Baron Harvard Pierre de Amortisson. The bogfisher likes hiding in dark places in water. Master does not like baths. Footnote in the margin of the manuscript by Baron Spread Dolich. Right. <laughs> Bogfisher's made a scare of taking a bath. That's funny. What are these dots? Hmm. Dark spawn, anyway. Those who have sought to claim heaven by violence destroyed it. What was golden and pure turned black. Those who had once been made towards the brightest of their age were no longer men. Masters. Trinity's twelve one. Sin was the midwife that ushered the darkspawn into this world. The magisters fell from the golden city, and their fate encompassed all of our worlds. They were not alone. No one knows where the darkspawn come from. The dark mockery of men. In the darkest places, they thrive, growing in numbers as a plague of locusts will. In raids, they will often take captives, dragging their victims alive into the deep roads, but most evidence suggests that these are eaten. Ew. <laughs> like spiders, it seems the dark spawn prefer their food still breathing. Perhaps they are simply spawned by the darkness. Certainly, we know that evil has no trouble perpetrating itself. Perpetuating itself. What am I talking about? The last blight was in the Age of Towers, striking once again in the heart of Tevinter, spreading south into Orlais and east into the Free Marches. The plague spread as far as Ferelden, but the withering and twisting of the land stopped well beyond our borders. Here, Darkspawn have never been more than the stuff of legends. In the northern lands, however, particularly to Pinter and the Enderfells, they say Darkspawn haunt the hinterlands, preying on outlying farmers and isolated villages, a constant threat. From Ferelden Folklore and History by Sister Patrine Chantry Cusco. Right on. Okay, hey, who's next? Keep stopping. Not much to read. <laughs> A few natural non-darkspawn creatures to live in the deep roads, the deep stalker stalker is a reptilian cave dweller known for the burrowing into stone paths of deep roads and ambushing prey. Usually nugs. Oh <laughs> They hunt in packs, attacking with round mouths of serrated teeth. Oh god. Spitting poison from venom glands. Although a single deep stalker stalker poses little threat to any experienced explorer, packs can be lethal. From Tales Beneath the Earth by Brother Chenna TV. That dude's been everywhere. <laughs> I read about you, despair demon. 
Oh, dragon, oh god. Fully mature, adult female dragon is High Dragon, the great monster of legend, the rarest of all dragon kind. These dragons hollow out massive layers for themselves, but they need the space to house their harem of drakes as well as their eggs and dragon legs. <laughs> High dragons are seldom seen. They spend most of their time sleeping mating, living off their prey, living off prey their drakes bring back. But once every it's said they're like beets. <laughs> But once every hundred years or so, the high dragon prepares for clutching by emerging, clutching, by emerging from her lair and taking wing. She will fly far and wide, eating hundreds, most often livestock. Over the course of a few weeks, leaving smoldering devastation in her wake, then she returns to her lair to lay her eggs and will not again appear in the skies for another. Oh my God! Dragons are so awesome. <laughs> Dragonling. Why do I have two? Does that mean I found out everything I need to know about dragon wings? <laughs> Newly hatched dragons are roughly the size of a deer and voraciously hungry. They live for a short time in their mother's lair before venturing out on their own. The slender, wingless creatures are born in vast numbers as only a few survive to adulthood. Okay, research damage to dragons increased. That's awesome. I have read about phoenix. Foot soldiers. I have faced in Tevan duelists. Rodent Ash Warriors and Fog Warriors Skirmish. Is there something added? Research damage against humanoids increased. I'm pretty sure I read this. Uh, I'm pretty sure I read that. Anyway. Okay, I didn't read this though. Giant 938 Dragon. Fourth Harvest Mirror. Continued musings on Giants. I assume they encroach due to disruption of their environs. Perhaps calling dark spawn rerouted underground waters, altering the landscape of their prey. Food is seemingly their own motivator. I have observed them eating meat, grains, leaves, nearly anything digestible, with no care or joy for taste or texture. So complete is their scavenging that troll might be more academically <laughs> a more academically accurate term. But I cannot blame farming folk for imposing an obviously descriptive and obvious descriptive. Why? What is wrong with me? Okay. Usa, you can read. <laughs> Yet, are these giants merely beasts of destructive instinct? I followed one specimen from the north where they were somewhat more common. Invented breeding grounds, warmth of seasons, corruption of silent plains. Followed waterways, preferring to float its bulk, but never did I see any sense in its eye. Never did it appear to plan beyond its immediate surrounding. But I remained intrigued. For they have hands. And that means the potential to raise them in praise. <laughs> Throughout creation, upright beings with hands have been a sign of greater purpose. What will, what lesson maker in these strange children? I will approach tomorrow in your name. Excerpt annotated below in a different hand. Last entry in the letters of Brother Estomar has only recovered possession, likely because they were already flat. <laughs> this archivist's recommendation remind the neophytes that the tale of Sister Dariel in the Wolf's Den is a metaphor. <laughs> right. Okay. We got smushed by a giant. Giant spider. Maybe it's meant to be that size and regular ones are miniatures. <laughs> oh yeah. Great. I mean, a just and caring maker would create them that big to start. Then they can't hide. That's what bothers you, isn't it? The hiding. A big one like that? A good 12 footer? <laughs> sure, it's all fang and such. But you know where it is. Dark places where the weak veil is weak. Why are spiders where the veil is weak? Never surprised by a giant one because you had to go to their house. They're not on, <laughs> They're not on your face at night or in your boot in the morning. And if their web is as thick as a rigging, you don't have to worry about their hair, the hair on your neck. For the baby ones, they're right. <laughs> For the baby ones on the breeze, you ain't that right. Hitting a cloud of them while you're riding could be a dozen, but you only see one and you try to smash it. But when you look, the thing is gone, and now your arm itches right up to your shoulder, and your hair feels like it's back. <laughs> and that hair feels like it's back. But you can't unbuckle your helm because of the gauntlets, and now your hair. <laughs> now the hair and your ear is tingly. That's just about the worst, isn't it? I had such trouble with that. Records of the Red Cliff Guard, 4th, 14th Guardian, 939. Witness recounting of provocation and resulting brawl. No jailing's victim was being an ass. Oh my god. It's getting really late. Prologue. Sure, I haven't read about these. 
Those who have sought to claim heaven by violence destroyed it. What was golden and pure turned black. Those who had once been mage lords, the brightest of their age, were no longer men. You know what? I just read that. <laughs> I just read that. I just read all that. Didn't I? Uh, I read this part. <laughs> the last blight was in the Age of Towers, striking once again at the heart of Deventer, spreading south into Orlay, the east of the Free Marches. The plague spread as far as Ferelden, but the withering and twisting of the land stopped well beyond our borders. Here, Darkspawn have never been more than the stuff of legends. In the northern lands, however, particularly the Deventer and the Enderfells, Darkspawn haunt the hinterlands, preying on outlining. Uh, I did read this already. That's weird. But like Alpha. I would like to know more. Uh, Right into the Lord Varen's chamber, strong men on both sides holding the shackles. It had been stripped of weapons and beaten until we judged it barely capable of walking. I told you with the lone survivor of the dark spawn from the mines, Lord Varen said to it, or her lock, as I understand it. I am told that you spoke to my men when we captured you. The thing spoke, told them that they would die. Its voice was good or own savage, like a beast trained to mimic the language of men. But we made out its words clearly enough. Yes, said Lord Varen, you are smarter than your fellow beasts. Yes, said the beast. I would know more of this, said Lord Varen, that we might understand your people and negotiate. You will, said the beast. The men beat me until their knuckles bled. My blood mixed with theirs. Soon they will hear the song. Soon their blood will burn, and I will lead them. The men all looked at their hands, for the blood sickness of the dark spawn was known to us. When they did, the beast wrenched the shackles from their grip. Then it was upon Lord Varen, holding him by the throat. There is no talk, it said, no negotiation. You will die. Your world will die. Now do you understand? It snapped Lord Varen's neck and killed four men before we finally killed it. Oh. What do the Darkspawn know, then? What do they know? An excerpt from the Blighted Codex, a classified collection of studies on the Darkspawn, held safely in the Imperial Library in Menrathis, available only to members of the Magisterium. Well, I just read that shit, bitch. The Blind Codex, huh? Sounds interesting. I've read these. Just saying. Red Shade. The Revenant have not, though. An entire unit of men, all slain by one creature. I didn't believe it at first, your perfection. But it appears that this is so. We have a survivor. And while at first I thought his rantings pure exaggeration, it appears to be no simple skeleton. The descriptions of the creature's abilities were eerily similar to those of our brothers at Marnus Pell encountered almost a year age ago. Men pulled through the air to skewer themselves on the creature's blade, and attacked so quick that it was able to assault multiple opponents at once. No, your perfection. What we have here is indeed a revenant, and nothing less. Ah, from letter to Valinamar the Third, five seventy one exalted. Revenant is a corpse possessed by a demon of pride or desire making it among the most powerful possessed opponents one can face. Many possess spells, but most are armed and armored and prefer the use of their martial talent. They are weak against physical attacks, but regenerate quickly, and commonly use telekinesis to pull opponents into melee range should they try to flee. Revenants also have the ability to strike multiple opponents surrounding them, stay at range if possible, and strike quickly. That is the only way to take down such a creature. I mixed that up, but it still made sense. Wraith. Like wisps, wraiths are sometimes thought to be the remains. Oh, I just got the damage thing. There's nothing new. <laughs> Yay! Groups. What, what's new in the groups? Not that, not that, not that. This is new. Can we to Masterlands? Annie Goodwin lay on the hard stones of Griswold Docks until the sailors left with her purse. She struggled to her feet. A large gray hand reached down to help her. It was one of those canari. Great horn giants who had come to live in the city. I thank you, said Nanny Goodwin hesitantly, looking for a satchel. I did not know the docks were so dangerous, or why I would have asked one of Lord G's guards to accompany as I brought healing herbs for the children. You are to master him, said the canary. Under the queue, no sailor would cost you. Why are you here? I am, but Lord G's natty, Nanny Goodwin said, and Lord G's <laughs> did not believe me when I told him that the children would be healing herbs, so I was forced to buy them myself. Under the cune, said the canary, to masterns are trusted and listened to in caring for the children, and any healing herbs they needed would be provided. Why did Lord Jean not attend your words? He is a noble, Nanny Goodwin said, 
and I am merely a servant who cares for his children. She shifted her shawl to the side of the bruises, sold soldiers had to hide the bruises the soldiers, as well as the bruises Lord G himself had left. Oh my god. Out of the cube, said the canary, all are equal. No Tomasrum thinks herself as a mere of anything. Then a good one bid the canary good day and returned to high town with much to think about. Hmm. Wow. An expert excerpt from the lives of the nobles and the truth of the king. So I know. Wow. Probably her. Something. Canari, Ben Hasrath. Suggesting that all Ben Hasrath are spies, like assuming that all craftsmen are carpenters. The Ben Hasrath form a significant portion of the Canari priesthood, tending to a variety of tasks within Canari society. Kidari City's Ben Hasrath serve as something akin to a town guard, investigating anything that disrupts the orderly function of the city. Ben Hasrath re educators treat criminals and rebels against the cube, determining whether they must destroy the subject's minds using a poison known as Kamek. Those they can rehabilitate through treatment and education are later transferred to simple work details. In contested or war ridden areas, Ben Hasrath coordinate with the Kidari military to trap the Red and Talbashoth rebels. Functions similar to bounty hunting. Outside Canary borders, Ben Hasrath agents primarily observe and report. While this may seem underhanded, it is no more than the most nations do with their own spies, and the Canary are perhaps, rightly in retrospect, extremely concerned with their danger of our culture's comparatively liberated mages and popes. Okay. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Our assumption that all Ben Hasrath are malicious spies bent on bringing or lay into the queue has no basis in fact. This simple prejudice against a race whose appearance unsettles us, compounded by a guilty conscience, seeing how many peasants, especially elves, prefer life under the queue to life under our empress. In our era, society of people, people with a different culture and a different values, but people nevertheless, as complex and nuanced as Ole. Excerpt from The Lion and the Bull, Racial Bias and Oversimplification of Canari, Societal Roles in the Orlesian Court. Author unknown, published by the University of Illinois. I almost want to say, <laughs> freaking Iron Bull wrote that himself because he called it, or he called it, because it's called the Lion and the Bull. He calls himself the Bull. A canard will call itself Bulls. <laughs> but who knows if even a canard wrote it, so. Just saying. Double mages. Wow, that's a lot. Whereas the circle was established not merely to protect the world from mages, but also to allow mages to practice their arts safely and without fear, and, whereas under Lord Secret Lambert's command, the Templars sworn to protect all people, including mages, from the harmful effects of magic, have instead persecuted mages with such biased judgment as to worsen the problems they were meant to mitigate, and whereas the right of tranquility, intended as a tool of last resort to stop and control mages from hurting themselves or others, has instead been used for punitive and political purposes to silence dissent and inhibit civilized discourse, and, whereas Entrasi herself intended the relationship between Mage and Templar to be one of practitioner and protector, not prisoner and jailer, and this contract has been broken, leaving mages in fear for their lives from those sworn to protect them. Now, therefore, the Circle of Magi declares the following. We, the mages of Raudnorole, do hereby dissolve the circles and renounce our sworn submission to the Order of the Templars, effective immediately. We reiterate Andraste's assertion that magic was made to serve man, not rule over him, and state unequivocally that we will use our abilities only to defend ourselves from those who would see us relinquish our lives and freedoms under the presumption of guilt for crimes we have not committed. We condemn those practitioners of magic who, through illness of mind or understandable but misguided anger at those who repressed them, would use their make or given powers to threaten innocent lives, and we pledge to aid any legitimate and impartial government in bringing these lawless apostates to justice. We look to earnestly we look earnestly to a future of cooperation between all people of Thetis, free from persecution and prejudice, and hope to build a better world alongside all who approach us with friendship instead of fear. Here's a service to Andraste and the Maker, three mages of Thetis. Leaflet distributed in towns and villages across Ole and for Elven. Wow. Hmm. That's pretty hardcore. The Avars. Even across the Frostbacks in ancient time, the Alamari tribesmen split into three groups. One settled in the Ferelden Valley, one was pushed into the Kukari Wilds, and the last returned to the mountains. Modern Ferelden's bear little resemblance to their Alamari ancestors. The Chasen remember few of their traditions, but the Avar have changed little throughout the ages. 
Like the Chasian, the Avar are not united people. Each tribe fends for itself and is beholden only to its thane. They still follow their own gods, Court the Mountain Father. They call them Winter's Breath, the Lady of the Skies, as well as a dozen of animal gods, never named outsiders. Nothing lasts in the mountains. Wind and rain eventually eat away the strongest holds. Valleys that were able that were arable one generation are locked in year-round ice the next. The game is constantly on the move. Even amongst themselves, the Avar make no absolute promises. They wed by a tradition in which the groom struggles to unite a tightly knotted rope, while the bride sings a hymn to one of the gods. However, many knots she is undone by the time her song ends is the number of years she will spend with him. Lowlanders often forget that there is no such thing as a permanent alliance in the Frostback. And for Elven Folklore and History by Sister Petrine, Chantry Scholar. Ooh, she writes all kinds of shit. <laughs> friends of Red Jenny. The friends, don't poke them, it's tempting, because what else can you do? But don't. Never know what you'll get, because Red Jenny, she's been around a long time. She's everywhere, and she hits hard as she hits light. The choosing isn't up to you. If you want someone to get their desserts, save your coppers for a moral crow, know what you're getting. Notes from Sir Kyder, a traveling merchant. Sun herbal. Their distraction, whatever they are, keeps people busy in Lord's Edgy. And with the assaults not having any bearing, we've been paid to strike guest rivals several times now. Bard should pay her a commission, Anonymous. My father went after her once. You want to lose your friends fast, just say you're tracking hers. He found a report that said she was killed in a bar. Everyone in that command, to a man dead or hobbled, or somehow lost their claims during the winter following. You know, when that was written 52 years ago, I'll take a witch over whatever she is. Let her pick at the nobles. I think it's nature. Recommendations of Captain Varn. Private. Militiaman contracting Denneran. How does it work? You tell me how to tell. Ask for something bad to happen. Eventually something does. Did she do it? Doesn't matter. Either way, you think you had a piece. Maybe that's enough. Interview at Mulsamar Tavern. No name given. I know it was her. Keys do not simply go missing. The horses? I suppose they were loose quiet by the accident? Quiet by the accident? And the fire that swept the southern quarter, the flooding in my summer home, the drop in the price of trade goods that just happened to coincide with my plans to sell the investments, the cholera I suffered last season, the weather does not inclement whatever I'm traveling, you cannot tell me that all these things were no mere happenstance. Perhaps your disbelief is her doing as well. You're dismissed. Everyone is dismissed. The scattered notes of Ben or Cal. <laughs> the Grey Wardens. The blight had ravaged the land for months. The armies of the great kings amassed for one last stand. As the sun burst through the clouds that boiled and churned in the dark sky, it illuminated a vast, seething horde of dark spawn with the archdemon at its head. It was then when courage seemed to fail and all lost to death and despair that the Grey Wardens came. They arrived with the beating of wings like mighty war drums and stood before the armies of men. The Grey Wardens grim and fearless marched forth between men and the encroaching dark spawn. They formed a shield of their own bodies and held that line until the archdemon was dead, and the last of the darkspawn lay trampled in the dirt. Then, demanding neither reward nor recognition for their sacrifice, the Grey Wardens departed. When the clouds rolled back and the sun shone full upon the blighted ground, the great kings knew that they had lost no men, that none of their blood had been spilled. This is a tale about no Grey Warden, no battle the Grey Wardens have fought, yet about all of them. They have always defended us from the dark spawn, taking losses so we do not have to. Adaptation of Grey Warden Legend. I'm pretty sure that's like word for word what Win tells you, so quote Win. <laughs> the tale outlined, oh god. <laughs> the tale outlined above is widely told, although subject to regional variations, free marchers might substitute great kings for titles bestowed in their given city states. And for all them, the implied army of awards is sometimes replaced with two. Representative of the national heroes who fought and defeated the Archdemon at Denneran during the Fifth Blight. Oh my god, that's awesome. <laughs> they they re reincarnated that story to Alistair and uh, the Warden, I guess. Depending on whoever yours was. Mine was Kuesland. <laughs> the Meeting of Wings is a reference to the Griffins. The Wardens said, are said to have ridden into battle. Although Griffins went extinct long before the recent blight, they still appear in numerous stories, sometimes serving as a metaphor for the Wardens. Unrestrained courage, but also employed to please an eager audience. From Tales of the Wardens by Sister Manon. With the Pentagasts. Allow me to correct you on one important friend. The Pentagasts are in Navarra. Without us, this nation would either be still one of the motley city-states that compromised the free marches, or under Orlesian control. 
More likely the latter, as only Navarra's strength holds back the Empire's expansion. And by that I refer to the brilliance of the Pentagast generals and the influence of the Pentagast coin. I find it interesting that you mention dragon hunting as our only significant trait. You do understand, I hope, that dragons disappeared centuries ago, only recently returning at the beginning of this age. Some of our clan have taken up the old trade out of nostalgia. My cousin Ferdinand, the most prominent among them, but those days are largely done. Today there are fourteen branches of the family, eighteen at one counts of relations among the Van Markhams, each consisting of the multiple families and twisting bloodlines connecting us to almost every major house across the ages. I am fully aware that King Marcus wanes in health, and neither he nor Ferdinand have children. But make no mistake, there will be another Pentecost sitting on the Navarre throne. And that man or woman will lead us into a prosperous future. There will be no civil war. From a letter of Baroness Al Alia Pentecost, Dragon 938. Mm-mm. Sorry. Okay. The people of the Cune are perhaps the least understood group in Thetis. The Canari Wars were brutal. So was the Chantry Schism. So was the fall of the Imperium. Some of the misunderstanding is an accident of nature. The race we call Cunari yeah, are formidable. Nature has given them fierce horns and strange eyes and the ignorant look on them and, and the ignorant look on them and see monsters. Some is an accident of language. Few among the Cunes people speak the common tongue, and fewer speak it well. In a culture that strives for mastery to only have only a passable degree of skill is humiliating indeed, so they often keep quiet among foreigners out of shame. But much of it is a result of the culture itself. They can already view their whole society as a single creature, a living entity whose health and well-being are our responsibility, the responsibility of all. Each individual is only a tiny part of the whole, a drop of blood in its veins. Important for Important not for itself, but for what it is, the whole creature. Because of this, the Canari most. Because of this, the Canari most outsiders meet belong to the army, which the Cune regards as a support of the physical body, arms, legs, eyes, and ears, the things a creature needs in order to interact with the world. One cannot get to know a person solely by sedging his hand or foot, and so one cannot truly meet the Canari until one has visited their cities. That is where the mind and soul dwell. In Saharan and Parvalin, we can truly see the Canari in their entirety. There, the unification of the Canari to a single being is most evident. Workers, whom the Kuhn calls the mind, produce everything the Canari require. The soul, the priesthood, seeks a greater understanding of the self, the world, and the exhorts, the body, and the mind, to continually strive for perfection. Oh my gosh, I'm so tired. <laughs> the body serves the go between the mind, soul, and the world. Everyone and everything has a place decided by the Cune, in which the work, they work for the good of the whole. It is life, certainty of equality, if not individuality. For the writing of Sphere Kant R, 841 Blessed. Ooh. Oh no. <laughs> Probably have to read that. Seekers of Truth. The Seekers of Truth aren't Templars, not precisely. Once they were called the Inquisition, but upon the signings of the Navarran Accord, they gave up that name and became the order they are now, standing over as Templars, as Watchers and Enforcers. I honestly cannot claim to know more than that. I don't know how many Seekers there are. A few dozen? If they have a base of operations, I don't know where it is. Certainly not with any of us. The only time we'll see one is when a Seeker is summoned, perhaps in a response to a complaint by one of the first Enchanters. They'll investigate the problem, and if it turns out a Templar did something they don't like, he's disciplined, severely, without question. Even the Night Commander bows to the will. Will, if Seeker of the Truth shows up, you know every last Templar is sweating, hoping their gaze doesn't fall on him. Of course, that changed when the Navarre Accord was broken. I'm told the Chantry broke it, but it was Lord Seeker Lambert who made the announcement. He said the Seekers of Truth and the Templar Order were going to hunt rebel mages, no matter what the Divine commanded. I didn't know he had that authority, that he could just say we would do this and everyone would follow, but we did. I never thought of it that way, but the Seekers have always been our guides, now they've led us into war. From a letter written by Sir Jonathan Perry, 940 Drive. Damn! Or, Templar Order, End of an Accord, Most Holy. The Seekers are well aware of the part you played in the Rebellion. You call me to the Grand Cathedral in the middle of the night on urgent business only to speak of trivial matters, and then when I return to the White Spire I discover chaos, and one of your agents in the midst of the apostates. Did you think I would not notice? 
Did you believe yourself above repercussions for such acts? It was a dark day when the chance replaced such an incapable woman on the sunburst throne. I will not stand idle and watch you destroy what ages of tradition and righteousness have built. In the twentieth year of the divine age, the Navarran Accord was signed, and the Seekers of Truth lowered our banner and agreed to serve at the Chantry's right hand, and together we created the Circle of Magi. With the Circle no more, I hereby declare the Accord null and void. Neither the Seekers of Truth nor the Templar Order recognize Chantry authority. Instead, we will perform the Maker's work as it was meant to be done, as we see fit. Signed this day in the fortieth year of Dragon Age, Seeker Lambert Van Reeves. Dick. Letter sent to divine Justinia from the former Lord Seeker. The Templar, or the traditional order. Ooh. Okay. Often portrayed as stoic and grim, the Order of Templars was created as the martial arm of the Chantry, armed with the ability to dispel and resist magic in addition to their formidable combat talents. Templars are uniquely qualified to act as both a foil for apostates, mages who refuse to submit to the authority of the Circle, and a first line of defense against dark powers of blood mages and abominations. While mages often resent the Templars as symbols of the Chantry's control over magic, the people of Theta see them as saviors and holy warriors, champions of all that is good, armed with, the, armed with piety enough to protect the world from ravages of foul magic. In reality, the Chantry's militant arm looks first for the skilled warriors with unshakable faith in the Maker, with a flawless moral center as a secondary concern. Templars must carry out their duty with an emotional distance, and the order of the Templars prefers soldiers with religious fervor and absolute loyalty over paragons of virtue who might question orders when it comes to make a difficult choice. The Templar's power derives from the substance lyrium, a mineral believed to be the raw element of creation. While mages use lyrium in their arcane spells and rituals, Templars ingest the primordial mineral to enhance their abilities to resist and dispel magic. Lyrium use is regulated by the Chantry, but some Templars suffer from Lyrium addiction, the effects of which include paranoia, obsession, and dementia. Templars knowingly submit themselves to this treatment and in the service of the Order and the Maker. It is this sense of ruthless piety that most frightens mages when they are drawn to the Templars' attention. When the, mages, when the, <laughs> when the Templars are sent to eliminate a possible blood mage, there is no reasoning with them, and the if the Templars are prepared, the mage's magic is all but useless. Driven by their faith, the Templars are one of the most feared and respected forces in Thetis. From patterns within, from, from patterns within form, by Holden. First Enchanter of Starkade, an 880 blessing. Whoa. Well, well, you know what? That's going to do it for now. In the next uh, episode, we will continue on with the game. I am going to record another Codex episode right now, but I'll just upload it sometime down the line in the future so yeah thank you so much for watching i will see you in the next one bye